I know one of the, uh, the most common questions I got asked by a lot of people uh, when I would point out what was going on in AA, uh, and even on here uh, from time to time from people who want to defend AA, is did you ever think about trying to go to other meetings? And uh, <clears throat> I always thought it was funny that they would uh, suggest that to me in a way like I could have never possibly imagined going to a different meeting in all my over a decade of, of being in AA meetings that I only went to one single group and then that was the group that I judged the entire program uh, based off of and of course if I had told them uh, that I'd been in meetings in several different states and if I had told them that I had been in different home groups and if I had told them I had different sponsors uh, it went in one ear and right out the other again because you know overall AA is not going to uh, take any kind of criticism into account. In fact, one of the very first telltale signs of a religious cult, according to an article I read one time when I was first uh, leaving AA, when I was trying to get away from it, is the fact that uh, critical thinking is, is obviously is scorned. It's not taken into consideration that you have an entity in the program that can never be wrong. Uh, and of course, you know, AA members are quick to point out there are no leaders, and I've done a video on that uh, before as well, that, you know, all these groups are just cluelessly uh, out there with no, with no direction whatsoever from any governing body or any governing authority, uh, which I, I, I've addressed that in another video, so I wasn't going to, I don't want to get veer to, uh, let me adjust the squeaky chair for a little bit. I didn't want to, uh, I put WD-40 on the thing and it's not working. It's a comfortable chair is the only reason why I haven't tossed it out and gotten a new one. Uh, but anyway, uh, I didn't want to get sidetracked and start talking about why that's very obviously not true. Uh, it, it, and uh, the fact that the matter is the big book cannot be criticized. The, uh, the literature cannot be criticized. The program itself or the home group or the anything about AA cannot be criticized. Uh, if you fail in AA, it is automatically all your fault and you get all the blame for it. And then, of course, if you quit drinking, uh, AA takes all the credit for that. But it, it would always kind of, uh, I don't know if I would call it amusing but I, or, or if I would just sigh in exasperation about it. But, you know, sooner or later, if you were pointing out something that was going on in AA meetings, people would say, well, have you tried different meetings? Uh, and, of course, it's, it's kind of interesting that they admit to the fact a lot of these people who are highly critical of what I put out here, uh, some of them I, I don't bother publishing their comments. When they leave me about 20 comments uh, to subscribers, not just me, I don't mind an insult. They were there. I had millions of insults when I was in AA. Uh, but when they start attacking uh, other people's comments and everything like that, I'm not going to fuck around with them. But uh, <clears throat> the, the, the thing about it was, uh, you know, it's the meetings are bad, the program's perfect, which I've talked about, I think, right now in the last three videos I've touched upon that because I keep getting that criticism. But it is a very telltale sign that all these meetings are founded on the notion of the big book being the absolute truth about alcoholism, which there is no such thing as alcoholism. Uh, yet the people who follow and adhere to and pretend to uh, adhere to the guidelines of the book, it, it ultimately turns out, uh, uh, in other words, the meetings themselves are a hotbed of really horrible uh, dregs of the earth kind of people who all claim to adhere to the big book and who are usually the well-respected members of AA. It is not the people uh, who are court-ordered in or who are picking up white chips every other week and who are more or less deemed social outcasts in the program of Quackaholics Anonymous uh, that are the predators, you know, it's the esteemed elders that claim to have had, you know, the, the uh, grand narratives of the sponsor who took them through the steps and God, you know, laid their hands on them and healed them. I don't know if anybody remembers uh, those televangelist kind of guys that were pretty big uh, back in the 1980s. A lot of them got caught in being frauds, you know, Jim and Tammy Baker come to mind and a few others, but uh, they would tell you to lay your hand on the television set and you were going to get healed, uh, you know, by whatever it is. But... It, it, the uh, I remember a video put out by a guy named Dark Matter. Uh, well, that was his screen handle, Dark Matter twenty five twenty five. I think is what he called himself. I haven't seen anything by him in a while. He he made cartoons. He made cartoons about religion and God. They were very blasphemous, of course. But he he brought about a point in one of his cartoons where uh, the cartoon figure of of God 
uh, literally says if a painting is bad, you know, do you blame the paint or do you blame the painter? And then if you have a watch that can't keep time, do you blame the watch for not working or do you blame the people that manufactured the watch? If you have this outlook that uh, all your creations are shitty, then it would stand to reason that that would mean the creator was shitty. So uh, from that logic alone, you could say that if you're adherent to this big book and everybody in these meetings are dregs of humanity, then it would stand to reason the big book is not some uh, miracle uh, beamed down from above that, that makes people better people. But what I was going to actually talk about, uh, it crossed my mind because the other, the other day uh, uh, when I was flipping through the news channels, the, the guy that's trying to run for president on the Democrat ticket, the RFK guy, you know, he has, the, he has that look of the, the, the old rich guy that's, you know, in shape, athletic, and all that other kind of thing. I know that, I know that what's wrong with his voice is not actually, he's not actually to blame for that. He actually does have a condition, you know, when he says all these kind of crazy conspiratory, conspiracy theory type things from what little I know of him. Uh, but uh, it reminded me of, a, of an AA group that I actually decided to go to when I was uh, trying different meetings. Uh, <clears throat> and it was during a time before I was court ordered. I was actually a willing participant in the insanity of the whole entire thing at the time. But uh, there was a meeting that was, I was going to this shitty clubhouse. Uh, I still had a license to drive at this time. I wasn't living in a garage and, you know, uh, uh, that close to being homeless like I was towards the end. So I wasn't really condemned to this particular shitty AA clubhouse. But I was going primarily to this AA clubhouse for meetings. And I, it was just, well, I don't even have to go into detail about what a horrible fucking place it was. And I just decided, you know... I'm not getting anything out of this. I'm drinking all the time anyway, and I'm scorned here for white chips, so I may just take their advice and try a different meeting. Well, I found one that I'd never heard of, and I was kind of hoping that it was far enough away from the AA clubhouse area at the time that I wasn't going to run into people I knew, uh, you know, at this, at this different meeting. I mean, the, the, the bad thing about the AA fellowship is everywhere you go, you just run into the same fucking people all over again. It was like a meeting I, I went to at 8 o'clock at night one time, and everybody getting called, I was like, yeah, we talked about this at the 10 o'clock meeting. We talked about this at the noon meeting. And again, I, I was sitting there thinking to myself, doesn't anybody work? Doesn't anybody have a fucking job? Doesn't anybody have any responsibilities whatsoever? I mean, how do these people go to two and three meetings a day like this? You know. But anyway, I went to this place, and uh, when I walked in, uh, I kind of had this feeling right away, okay, I do not belong with these people at all. I mean, I don't, I don't belong here. You know, the, the men were kind of like, like I said, the RFK kind of guy that I saw on the news. They were wearing expensive polo shirts. They had a sweater tied around the neck. Uh, they were wearing gold watches that would cost me a year's worth of salary. You know, they had on the real expensive sunglasses uh, perched on top of their foreheads. Uh, you know, even if they had gray hair and it wasn't dyed, it was kind of cut, you know, immaculately. You could tell they, 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 had, they didn't just go to hairstylists. They went to actual, you know, professional hairdressers that knew how to cut your hair where it was perfect and wouldn't fall out of place. Uh, they had the tan muscle. They had the tan uh, complexions uh, from being out in the sun. And you could tell they played tennis. Uh, and you could tell they probably played a lot of golf and, and you know, things of that nature. Uh, the ladies was kind of the same thing. They had the sun visors. They had the, 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 the really expensive. They either were wearing the really expensive professional office type dress like they were running for Congress or they were dressing like they had just come from or were going to the country club, you know, to play tennis or, or something like that. I walked into that room. I saw the cars in the parking lot. They were all uh, cars that I would never be able to even dream of trying to get a down payment on even in my lifetime. I wouldn't be able to make monthly payments on it. And there was just this terrified feeling inside of me because it was like, I really don't belong. <laughs> I don't really belong in this group of people at all. I mean, I, I felt like I was sticking out like a sore thumb, as the old saying goes. And uh, I took a seat in the very, very back. And of course, nobody really moved away from me because nobody sat close to me anyway. Uh, there were these real expensive pastries <laughs> I noticed when I walked in, and I thought, well, there's a plus here uh, to that. But I, when I reached for one of them, I had a napkin in my hand, by the way. I don't like, like, if you're eating a donut, I don't like 
getting that crap on my fingers. And I don't like getting it on my face. It's one reason why I, I kind of stay away from those, believe it or not. But as I was reaching towards one with a napkin in my hand, this lady said, would you please get a napkin? And I said, I have a napkin. And she's like, yeah, but get another one too while you're at it. And I was like, <laughs> anyway, uh, everybody, even though they had all this expensive coffee made, everybody had these Starbucks cups, you know, and, and a couple of uh, really upscale kind of coffee shops where, you know, uh, I, I, like again, I, like I said, it would probably cost me a week's salary to buy a coffee cup there. Uh, the purses some of the ladies had would probably, you know, you get the idea. I wouldn't even be able to, uh, I wouldn't even be able to, I uh, buy one of those purses on a week's salary, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I was I, I, I sat there in the back of the room, and I, I just felt like, you know, all eyes must be upon me. Uh, I was feeling really uncomfortable with the whole thing, and then the meeting started, and of course it kind of, the format was a lot different, not in the terms of, you know, it opened up with how it works, and it opened up with the traditions, and and it opened up, you know, with the, with the usual kind of thing, but, you know, there was no... Uh, there was nobody swearing and there was nobody that, you know, trying to impress anybody with their, with their major drunk law. At first, at first, I was going to say that because later on, and the point of the story I'll get to, and it's going to tie into that, but everybody was real professional and everybody was like, yes, you know, uh, I know that uh, in my, you know, when I was uh, in my corporate meeting the other day and I was looking at my million dollar stock portfolio and I was really worried about, you know, the future of my investment and uh, I just had to come back to the basics. I had to come back to the basics of I'm powerless over the economy, you know, <laughs> stuff like that was, it was kind of the, the context of the shares. There was a couple of ladies talking about uh, folding laundry and how, you know, the, the ability to deal with laundry and all this other kind of thing. I was just like, I really, really, really don't fucking belong here. I'm one of these degenerate skid row type drunks it, it, that I, there's no place for me here. I mean, like I said, it, it made me feel like a teenager back in high school. You know, when you kind of, you make a wrong turn in the hallway and you accidentally walk across all these popular kids you know, with their, with their, with their beautiful girlfriends and every, you know, the homecoming queen types. And you're like, oh shit, I made a wrong turn. Now I got to endure, you know, you get the idea. I think, I don't think I have to be any more descriptive than that. But towards the end of the meeting, after it was over with, cause I didn't know anybody, I says, you know, I might be onto a good thing here because nobody's going to call on me here. Nobody knows anything really uh, too much about me here. I mean, I, obviously, the way I look, I, I'm not going to be a part of the in crowd, which was a good thing. I kind of got to thinking about. It. I said, this is kind of a good thing. I can kind of blend in here, be invisible, not really blend in, but you know what I mean. I can, I can come here. I can sit in the back of the room. I can listen to what these people are saying, and I can leave, and, and nobody's going to notice. Nobody's going to care. I'm not going to have anybody coming up to me and saying, "Well, how much time do you have now?" You know, and then I would have to say something like three, four days, and they'd say. Mm, three, four days, and what are you going to do different this time? What are you doing differently this time so it doesn't happen to you again? Because if you're not doing anything different, you'll be drunk again, you know? You know what the big book said? I didn't have to endure that because I wasn't known there. It was a chronic relapse or so. You know, I, I said, I'm going to start going here. This is where I'm going to go every night. This is going to be my nightly meeting. I even uh, made it my home group there temporarily, uh, embarrassing as it is, because believe it or not, I did have a sponsor at the time, you know, the importance of a home group and all that. It's really cringeworthy how brainwashed I was. Uh, but over a period of time and a couple of months in, I began to notice that the behaviors, although it was more polished, although it was a little bit more hush-hush with the unethical things that were going on in here, the more aberrant things that were happening, it was basically the same get-up. You didn't have the you didn't have the the guys that were trying to pass themselves off as fake phony you know I was a member of a one percent motorcycle club and all that other kind of shit but ultimately at the core of it there was the same kind of shit going on but the star of the meeting and I thought this was interesting I didn't realize he was the star there until I had been around for a couple of months but he was this guy that I suspect was really full of shit. Uh, but he would get called on and he would go by route by the same story. He was like, you know, there's not too much in this world that frightens me. I mean, I've been halfway around the world, gunshot, Vietnam. I was in the penitentiary. I've been stabbed. Uh, I've had people try to kill me. I've been in a gunfight with the police. I've been in situations where, and he, he would always rhyme it like this. He would say, there were bullets flying and people dying. <laughs> Making the shit up, you got to be, you know, but... Uh, it, it surprised me how he was just admitted, you know, 
a big uh, violent criminal. I, I, he had some major stories that I know were totally probably ripped off some TV show somewhere or everything, but he was extremely popular. He was called on all the time, you know, and he would have to do his little spiel and he'd have to do his tough talk and then he would have to throw in a few quotable quotes or whatever. He was a major 13-stepper. Half of the so-called country club ladies that were there, uh, their sponsees or whatever, had been victimized by him at one point or the other, uh, you know, and it was actually kind of chuckled about in some kind of ways, you know, you know, he's here, he's got a lot of sobriety, but oh, he does have kind of a thing for girls who are practically almost underage, you know, and that kind of shit. It didn't take me long before, I think I went to that group for about six months, uh, and it didn't take me long to see the same kind of fucking behavior that I saw at the AA clubhouse. The AA clubhouses that I was trying to distance myself from, which I ended up back at, uh, towards the end of my time in AA, it, it, they were a little bit more out in the open. They were a little bit more crude about the shit they were doing. But the behaviors, the underhanded bullshit, it was all the same. Uh, the one thing that actually cracked me up, there was a, a semi-friend of mine who, who started going there with me. Uh, and he's a guy I've never been able to find again. He's one of the few people, uh, you know, in AA that I actually truly liked. There wasn't very many people that I encountered in AA that I really liked, but he was one of them. Uh, we wouldn't have looked like we were gumbada together, you know, as the Italians would say, but, you know, he was a corporate kind of guy, he was a suit and tie kind of guy, but uh, I met him at the AA clubhouse, ironically enough, but he didn't stay in AA very long. Everybody I, I met in AA that I totally loved, they, they, they left, the three or four people that I really truly liked in AA, but... He had asked me one time before meeting, he said, have you ever noticed in the format of this meeting, everybody who gets called on, no matter what the fucking topic is, they all say the same thing. Like, they'll say, I am really so glad you read that topic because I just was reading that this morning and I had not paid attention. And I, and I, went, to a, I went to one of those, you know, one of those night meetings and I sat down there and the very first person that was called on, they said, I am. I am just so glad you read that topic, you know, because it just so happens, and it's really a, a strange coincidence, but I was just reading that this morning. <laughs> and the next five people said the same fucking thing. The, uh, the point I was making about the, uh, about the entirety of this is that, yes, I did try different meetings. I did try different groups, and it was all the same reprehensible shitty behavior and the same condemnation of relapsers and the same some have to die so that others can live spiel. I actually do remember that they were having some celebration at this country club AA meeting, and that's what I'm going to call it for the purposes of this video. They were having a celebration that they had been at that building and they had been doing that at that group for like 17 years, and they were having some 17-year celebration. And of course, the guy who got nominated to speak was halfway around the world, shot, stabbed, burned, buried, dead, Vietnam, penitentiary, the bullets flying guy. When, you know, <laughs> But there was a, there was a, a lady that was kind of, quiet that was coming in around that same time that I, you know, that I started going there, but she was picking up a white chip that night. And one of these guru ladies that was called on in every meeting and was gifting us with her spiritual blabber, uh, literally said to her after the meeting, you know, it's so disgusting that you would relapse on our 17 year anniversary here and show up to this meeting to get a white chip and disgrace every day. You really are a fucking waste. And I was like, wow. What happened to the spiritual sugar would not melt in my mouth, lady, that I used to hear every night in this fucking group? Uh, but I do find it interesting that every single AA meeting I went to, all the different groups I tried, uh, all the different sponsors I had, all the different uh, places I lived in states that I moved in, uh, it was all the same shit. It was always the same reprehensible behaviors, the same kind of... Uh, nasty kind of crap, the same people that were dealing pills to newcomers, the same people that was doing all this shit, and they were always inevitably the esteemed, trusted servants of AA who knew the big book chapter and verse. Now, it's really funny to me, the people who point out that the big book is perfect and it's just the program in general, fail to see that if the people who claim to adhere by this big book are in fact shitty people who are utter hypocrites, that it, it, it would seem to me almost like a seemingly indictment of the program itself, especially when you consider the fact that the guy who wrote the big book was a con artist, was a con artist that engaged in every kind of aberrant behavior there was. And as a matter of fact, uh, at the time he wrote the 12 and 12, he had a breakup with a guy named Tom Powers. And Tom Powers is another scumbag, by the way. He's not the hero in my eyes because he broke away from Bill because he could no longer tolerate Bill's bullshit. 
Uh, but he never really told the absolute whole story about everything. In fact, in his later years, he actually said that when people would come around to get the full story on what Bill W. really was like, the kinds of things that Bill W. really did, he would turn them away because the AA program was perfect, and he just couldn't have it slandered by the, uh, the character shortcomings of one man. In other words... Uh, he was going to do what all the rest of these assholes do to comment on my videos. He was going to keep perpetuating that same fucking lie that somehow or the other, the big book, with its logical inconsistencies, with its total uh, meaningless, bold assertions about reality, which are not grounded in any scientific fact whatsoever, is somehow perfect, and all the people who are following it just aren't good enough. You know, they're just... They're bad people. They're not true alcoholics and all that other thing. It must be really nice to live in a world where when things are going in your favor, it's proof that everything is perfect. When things don't go in your, perfect, in your favor, it's the other person's fault. It's a conspiracy theory. It's the people aren't alcoholics. It's every kind of excuse under the planet. But when everything is favorable, it's, it's proof of God in the program. When it turns out that the program's not actually so perfect, well, that's just mean-spirited people like you who had a bad experience with AA, or that's just people who are not alcoholic, or that's just people who aren't willing to do the work. Anyway, I actually didn't realize that that little short story was going to turn into a 22-minute video, so I was going to uh, comment, re read this particular subscriber comment, and it said, strangers, uh, they write, that thought they knew me told my life was unmanageable and I was insane. They told me I was self-centered and self-seeking. They literally have a one-liner for anything you tell them. I'm going to stop for one second before I finish the comment. That is actually one thing I have noticed in AA is that they don't know anything about you when you walk through the door. They don't know anything about your background. They don't know anything about what you've been through. They don't know anything about what you've seen or what you've done or anything about you. But they immediately force you uh, into this bracket where you're a disgusting scumbag like all the rest of them, and you're driven by these particular character defects because the big book says so. If the shoe doesn't fit, they're going to make you wear the shoe. And they're not interested in, in hearing your side of the story and anything. I remember one guy was trying to tell me what was really wrong with me and what was really wrong with my own uh, family dynamics was this, this, and this. And of course, it was all my fault uh, because I was an alcoholic, as he put it. And I said, well, you know... This drama that I was about to explain, or that I was explaining to you, and I start, should have said before you fucking rudely interrupted me, has been going on since I was five years old. How much damage was I doing to my family when I was drunk at five years old? If this is, you know, the logic that you're spewing out here. They have this idea that you're already diagnosed, you're already what they say you are, and you have to live that role. To rip off Ozzy Osbourne, the media says it, and you live the role. Anyway... They didn't think, I'm reading the comment now, they didn't think my fifth step was honest enough, even though it was, and yet I can relate to that. You know, I've done every one of those steps to the best of my ability, which they say is all that's required, and then when they didn't do shit for me, uh, you know, that, well, I probably wasn't really willing to do them. I probably just didn't really want to do them. I was probably in denial, you know, the usual thing. Uh, surprise, they write. I'm not as much of a piece of shit as you all thought. Exactly. Just because you have a problem with drinking does not make you some horrible, disgusting human being uh, that likes to steal, manipulate, lie, cheat, and do whatever it is these people all think that you do just because you have an addiction problem. They're kind of, every accusation being a confession there. And then they wanted to tell me that I had to go off my medication on the comment. Fuck them. I went back out and doing better on the Sinclair method and fuck AA as a whole. And then he does a clever little semantic wordplay. A hole. <laughs> a, a as a hole. Yeah, a bunch of assholes. Anyway, uh, I, there was uh, more detail I kind of wanted to put into this as far as uh, the reflection of members and the literature itself. You know, if you look at certain organizations, and, and, and a lot of organizations are corrupt to the core, uh, you know, but the AA organization doesn't, it's not the fact that there's shitty people in the organization. That's my primary complaint, like some of my detractors are always talking about on here. Oh, you got bad people everywhere. You got bad people, you know, in the library. You got sex predators uh, in, the, in the YMCA gym. Yes, you do. But those kinds of people are called out. Those kinds of people, are, the police are, done, are called on them. There's an investigation into those kind of people. AA says, well, we can't do anything about it because the traditions. 
So the next time an AA member tells you, well, you know, uh, the program is full of bad people, but the program is perfect. Not the, pro the fucking program uh, could do something about that if it really wanted to, but it's not going to because of the traditions. And of course, there's no, there's no ending uh, uh, line uh, or throngs of these AA defenders that say, well, in my meeting, we, were, we ran them all out. In my meeting, we ran them all out. And you know, usually the ones who say that are usually the ones who are doing that. I remember one guy that used to uh, preach and preach and preach about how much he hated 13 steppers and how the men should stick with the men. And yeah, he was one of the worst ones. He liked to, he had a whole bunch of Xanax on hand that was prescribed by a doctor that he liked to sell people. Uh, people who were underage and people who were young and people who were women fresh out of treatment. That was his favorite victims. And of course, when I brought that up one time, this guy's a fucking drug dealer. This guy's a fucking sex predator. You know what I was told? He's been sober 20 years. How much time you got? One month? One day? Who are you to talk? You know, that's why the program is full of shitty people, because it attracts shitty people. The shitty people stay. You know, like I said, all the nice, all the, I'm not going to say nice, because, you know, I mean, nice is kind of a, a subjective term open to interpretation. But all the people that I really liked in AA that I met, all the people that I, that I kind of got along with, that I clicked with, that, that I had a common ground with, they all left after a very short period of time. So it seems like AA in general attracts a certain subset of the population. Now, I'm not talking about the old-timers who have left. I mean, I've, I've had uh, comments from people who were in AA 20 years and walked away. I think that's amazing that you, were, you, know, that you broke free of the cycle after that long. Uh, I, I've had comments from people who were old-timers that literally got fed up with the entire thing. I'm not saying every single person who's there for 20 years is, is necessarily an abhorrent person, but I am saying that in my experience... The esteemed old timers that think they're running the whole entire thing while they'll tell you they're practicing humility, they're usually the, the ones you got to be suspicious of, and they're the ones that are attracted to that dynamic, to that weird sponsor sponsee cult dynamic that AA promotes. Anyway, uh, see you guys next week. Chime in on the comments. Let me know about your experiences with trying different AA meetings. Until next time.